Thank you. Um, so, I've never done this before, so... <laughs> uh, <laughs> so, uh, Jess, um, the first question is, where did you grow up? And where did I like? grow up? Um, so, I grew up in this tiny, small farm town. Um, it was called Karangi. I usually refer to Coffs Harbour because it's the closest kind of main town to Karangi. In Karangi there was like a post office, a primary school, a service station, and an apartment, and that was pretty much it. And I was one of six in my year until I graduated, so there was absolutely nothing there. Um, I grew up in Karangi on this farm, around 200 acres, and um, that's where I started my first business when I was 16 or so. And that was, um, it was funny actually, I was a little bit, I thought I was a little bit rebellious. It was running kind of formal after-party events for students because my principal banned formal after-parties. <laughs> so we thought, we've got all this land and we can just, you know, pull together a sales team and a promotions team and then ended up kind of starting my first little event there in Grand Young Farm. Okay, yeah. great, great. And how did you came up with the stash idea and co-founded or yeah. founded it? Yeah. <laughs> um, so I'll give some more context. I grew up on this small farm in Coffs Harbour um, that started the event business. That business we then scaled and we figured out that we could use different paddocks at different venues. And we would do 16ths, 18ths, 21sts, formal after parties, and we'd have them scheduled at different times throughout the year. And I made quite a bit of money through that, which was interesting. And then I used that money to invest into um, like my uni education, so then moved to Sydney, and was studying fashion and business. And part of my degree was I had to do an internship in um, the industry that I wanted to be in. And I remember I went to my careers advisor and was like, hey, I want to be in the fashion industry. These are the industries um, that I've researched. These are the companies I want to be involved in. And she sat me down and she was like, just to be honest with you, you don't have any contacts. And you don't have any to have a career in the fashion industry. So let's put you into something more achievable like hospitality or whatever it might be. Um, so from there, I dropped out of university. Um, I decided to kind of back myself, essentially, and then went on to work throughout Australia, New York, and Paris Fashion Weeks. And I was producing runway shows, so it was everything from like model castings to model fittings to seating plans. And it was like, when you work on seating plans, it's the most political thing. <laughs> like people don't realize how political the whole seating plan situation is because one journalist can't be sitting next to the other one and they can't be near like a celebrity because if they hear them gossip they'll write about it or be in a publication it's this whole tetris of a of an experiment as any play um, but what i noticed in that was that the whole fashion industry was shifting and online was moving forward print was moving back influence was moving forward and i decided to realistically just take a punt on mobile and to take a punt on i guess the internet How and old online you know, um 21 22. When I was 22, I booked a one way ticket to San Fran and um, was just like, okay, if I'm going to build this app, I need to go to the tech center of the world. <laughs> Google, where do you go? Where's the tech center of the world? Then just booked a one way ticket to Silicon Valley. Didn't know anybody, stayed in a hostel for like two, three months, ate two minute noodles, um, but managed to meet people from like Yahoo, Facebook, Google, and then uh, I just quizzed them. I was like, how do I build this app? What do I need to do? Who do I need to find? Um, um. What forced you or who gave you advice to go to the US at the time? It was kind of just a gut thing. Yeah, Yeah, it was, um, like, I've always been quite ambitious, so it was more so, like, if I'm going to do this and take it seriously and leave, like, at that time, I was working throughout Australia, New York, and Paris, and I would go between the three twice a year, so it was a pretty, I mean, it was fun. (laughs) So I thought, if I'm going to take a leap and do something in tech, which is very left field, but I knew that there was a market there, I knew there was a problem there, that I wanted to align and learn from the best people in the world. So I was like, okay, where's that? It's in San Francisco, so off I went. Nice. And uh, once you came back, you are mm-hmm. in Australia. Yeah. And how did you go from there? Yeah, so what did I do then? I had a bit of an action plan, still no idea, realistically, very naive. Like, I was like, yes, I can build this, like, a room in a day in an app. It was a lot harder than what I initially thought. Um, but what I did is I moved into fish burners. Um, that wasn't as big of a deal back then. Like that was maybe, how old was I? I was 20, like just 22 and I'm 25 now, so three years ago. Um, and what I did was I just hustled around there and found a developer. I found a guy actually was working on another business and I was like, hey, I've got this idea. I just got back from San Fran. Like, can you help me build it and I'll give you some equity. 
and um, he agreed to, so that's good. I didn't have to spend anything. <laughs> I didn't have any money after San Francisco, so that was a positive. Um, but yeah, that's how I initially built it as I found a tech co-founder. Um, he built the initial MVP, um, and then we just trial tested that, went to fashion schools, brought on some more boutique brands to test it out, and then once we had some core metrics, we then went and found an angel, a couple of angel investors, and then, so Fishburne would be helpful at the time. Fishburne is amazing, yeah. Yeah, just yeah. co-working spaces, you know, something yeah. like this, and coming and chatting with people and finding some, you know, yeah. like-minded people. Or well, realistically, when you don't know anything about a certain space, you've got to surround yourself with people who do, yeah. and then just learn as quickly as possible and just find people who can do what you can't, really. And, and networks as well. Yeah, exactly. You know, people, yeah. And people know some people in that yeah. space and that yeah. kind of thing. I spoke to everyone now because Fishburne has obviously grown a lot since then. Like back then, they had they were only really using the first floor, and I remember it was one of like three females. There was me, GM, and one other girl. <laughs> so that's obviously increased since then as well. So it was awesome. It was just like learning from other more technical minded people, finding a co-founder, and then um, just having someone cheap to work. And, and you were you were all obviously you know in the male dominated industry. Yes. How did you find? You know, especially back then. Yeah, back then I stuck out like a sore thumb. Like it was very like there wasn't many fashion tech startups then, like at all. So, like going to meetups. I remember actually, um, I went to this meetup and we had a little bit of press around Stash at this point. And I was speaking to an investor and I was speaking about Stash and he was like, Oh yeah, so where's your CEO? Are you the intern? <laughs> I was like, No, <laughs> that would be me. <laughs> um, and he kind of looked at me blank faced and thought I was joking and I was like. <laughs> so you get like it was interesting at the start it was either black or white people either wanted to really help you because they had a lot of passion for supporting women entrepreneurs um, or they completely didn't, didn't take you seriously at all thought you were joking and thought you were the intern so it was very kind of black and white but now I think it's a lot better than what it was okay. yeah and you end up in China because of the next the same course. reason why you did yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no we went a little bit before that but yeah. we went to the show through you know some networks, but I'm yeah. sure because of the first banner you heard of the next yeah, yeah. and how they approach you. That's and so then, funny. Um, yeah. Yeah, give us that, you know, how that happened. Yeah. The presentations, you know, the stress, you know, for yeah. presentations to get yeah. you yeah, select you to go to China. Yeah, it was so funny. That's just it's just and, funny. But just for information of people, so the show was kind of. You know, cross it was like Shark Tank. I would explain it like yeah. it's like Shark Tank cross the Apprentice. So it's like you go there and you're pitching to this panel of judges, but you had diverse different teams and do all these like really hardcore challenges and things like that. So what it was was a global search for the next billion dollar business, next unicorn. Um, and what they did, a VC firm put it on and they flew around to Australia, the US, Israel, where else did they go, Asia? Yeah, Asia, Taiwan. Taiwan, yeah, everywhere. Korea. Yeah, and they heard from all of these different startups who were pitching their business and uh, like the theme of it was can you be a billion dollar business and will your business work in China um, and then they selected 55 teams to fly to Shanghai we pitched to the ex-CEO of Alibaba, seed investors in Baidu, seed investors in PayPal, um, people from Zen Fund, people from Sequoia which are huge VC firms in China and we were one of the 55 teams who got selected globally to go and do that. Yeah, and they paid for our accommodation and yeah, flying to go there. <laughs> <laughs> it was not the best, but we, yeah. it was well, and we were there for three weeks. Three it was weeks. very, very intense. It was very intense. Yeah. And what did we have to do? I remember when we pitched, like, okay, so we're pitching and it was quite daunting because you're in front of all these judges, right? But just take into account that what it's airing to is 15 million people in China. And then you've got 200 people in an audience who have this clicker, and they later on vote for whether they want you to go through or not. And each time a judge like likes you or doesn't like you, they press this huge red button on the table, and it lights up this massive unicorn head behind them. <laughs> so it's, it's like intimidating on all fronts. And then if that's not enough, you're speaking to judges who speak Mandarin and you speak English, and you've got this earpiece on. Remember the earpiece? It was just yeah. like. A Complete pain, <laughs> like horrible broken. And the, the, the interpreter was not good, and oh, the translation, yeah. Oh my god. And we had to struggle to understand what they mean, and yeah. the, some of the answers were different to the questions. Yes. So, <laughs> I remember. I remember at one point I like figured out how to like hack it to get more time to think. You just like hold on to it and pretend that you couldn't hear, but you're actually thinking of an answer. <laughs> they didn't really know, so it was fine. 
Um, but yeah, it was that was an interesting part. So it was like kind of challenging on all fronts. And then if the whole landscape of what you were doing wasn't enough, they would make you like verse teams, or you had to like one of the rounds was I, we both did this round. You had three minutes to pitch your business only using numbers. Um, you had no clicker or no slides, and you were on this huge stage, and you had three minutes to just use metrics from your business. But you had to tie them into kind of a story and you had to remember the timing, you had to remember the order, and you had to remember all these facts around your business and then articulate it in a way that they're going to firstly understand, but then secondly is engaging and is in line timing-wise with what's coming up behind you on this giant screen. You, you did that one as well, didn't yeah. you? Yeah. So we both got to the last round. Yeah. Of, and it was, I think, two or four times we've gone through it. Yeah, to get to the so we final. got to the finals. And, uh, yeah, one of the other interesting thing was, you know, they wanted to, because it was a TV show, so they wanted to make it dramatic. Yeah. And they were really pushing you sometimes really hard to yeah. go emotionally crazy. Yeah. yeah. They wanted, like, story books. Like, they were, it's like The Voice. You know how there's always, like, these token characters who've got these big emotional stories? It was kind of like that as well. Like, they wanted this sense of drama. So it was, like, hardcore because you're pitching to legitimate VC funding. But then it's also a mix of you had to have, like, the TV aspect in there as well. I think because it was their first time, like, we were kind of the guinea pigs a little bit as well. Yeah. So, um, just to let you know, guys, so we went to the top final Western yeah. team in the final, so the winner was the Chinese team. Yeah, so, so we yeah, Vahid and I, we were the last Western teams in the competition. So, so how many started and how many ended up in the final? So, who got taken from, um, like, the multiple countries through to Shanghai was 55 teams, um, and then we made it to the finals. And then 16 the, was in the finals. Yeah, yeah, and then from there it was... Um, the winner was a Segway company um, who had like seven different patents and they already had some funding from Zen Fund as well. Um, he had a really good backstory as well, that guy. <laughs> like young Chinese guy brought like cool story as well. Um, and then the guy who came second was planning to be a competitor to Google Glass and he came from one of the top tier companies in China as well and just convinced his whole department to leave. So it's funny, whenever we went onto the stage, it would go, it would be him and like 12 other people and they'd just stand behind him and he'd be like, this is my team. He was just convinced to leave a whole department of this like really reputable firm. I think that was a large part of his sell as well because like if you can do that, like that's pretty impressive. <laughs> so um, that experience led you to, to stay in China, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah. So, so how, how that how ended that up? Happen? Yeah. yeah, so it's interesting how it all came together. So we... Like I just made the decision that um, after looking at the market some more and looking at the opportunity being that we're going to be in front of 15 million people realistically, that between when the filming finished and when it aired it was three months. So I was like, hey team, we've got to pull together an app that works in China <laughs> in three months. Um, and we did that, which is great. And so we developed a whole new version of the app, had it all localised what we thought anyway for China. Um, and then once the show aired, um, we had been working non-stop for three months and we were watching, we were sitting there with our analytics and watching everything as the show was airing. And then um, as it finished, we realised that we had 11 downloads after the first show and it aired to like 15 million people. And I'm sitting there with like my investors and my team and we just worked like ridiculous amounts of hours for three months. So we're sitting there and we're like, wow, we just got 11 downloads, like what has gone on? These numbers just don't match up. And what we realised is we did kind of a few things wrong. Um, the first one was we weren't localised at all as much as what we needed to be. Like our login processes were um, not with the platforms that our market was using. We realised that we had to integrate with like Weibo, we had to change to QQ, we had to make it very much so localised, a lot more than what we were. Um, we had to change our server configurations, like there was a lot more around just getting people to discover Stash and then onto the <coughs> Apple stores and then we initially started off with 10 different app stores in, in China. This is just, a, I found it fascinating. On the Western side, you've got Apple and Android. In China, you've got 10 leading app stores. Um, each of those app stores has a different process to upload as well, different processes to feature. Like it's all its own process per app store. So we initially launched into 10 different app stores. Um, we figured out that that's way too complex for our small team to be able to figure out how to use all 10 of them. So we zoned that back into three and just focused on three app stores. We focused on Tencent, um, Huawei, and one other one I can't remember. 
and we just really zone in on them and like, you know, let's try and feature in these three because the viewership of them is obviously huge. Um, and then the third thing we realised was that the demographic who were watching the show weren't necessarily the demographic of our user base. Um, our users are millennials, young girls, this aired on CBM, which is a business network. So what we realised we had to do was to more so take the fact that we were on the show and use that as positioning to then go and align with a PR company who would just take that as information and then just repackage it and then put it in front of lifestyle bloggers, KOLs, fashion magazines, and then pump it out into them in, a, in like a language that they understand. Um, and then once we had that as a base to work from, we reached out to KOLs and then had them engaging with us, posting about the show um, each episode. But it was a lot of tweaking. Like we thought we were just gonna be fine and we just, you know, we just launched this app and it goes into app stores and we've got a gazillion downloads, but it was a lot of localization. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Uh, similar to me, yeah, to us. So, but, um... The thing is, for us, we decided finally that we better focus on the US yeah. and China. So, what, what, made what, what, what made you make that decision? Can I ask you a question? <laughs> <laughs> I thought it's the other way. <laughs> yeah. uh, so, we basically found that they, they told us we need to have a co founder in yeah. China who has come from the big companies like Tencent, or Alibaba, or from the top universities. And at the time, we didn't have we didn't have it, and we got some traction, good traction in the US. So that's why we decided it works easier for us. Uh, but we found that the China market is huge, really and at the same time, it's very, very challenging. Yeah. So how did you find yourself different from us? Why well, did we decide to go forward yeah, with it? Yeah, go with the challenge. Yeah, there's a few things. A lot of it has to do with timing, and the market, and a local partner. So. Timing-wise, I'm sure a lot of people here know there's a whole like economic shift happening. There's the whole rise in the middle class in China, and that there's 300 million people who have more money than what they've ever had before. Um, 450 million people in China right now are millennials. The way in which millennials shop has completely changed over even the last two, like two, five to two years. Um, the way millennials shop now is where previously they would look for exclusively kind of luxury brands. They're more so going to be more self-expressive and individual, and they want to more so stand out and be more conformist like their parents were. So we found that the size of the market, firstly, the way in which um, millennials are our target, um, how they're acting, and how well timed that is for us was a huge thing. Um, this it was uh, I can't forget this fact I heard the other week. It was um by this is something called the 2030 rule, and by 2030 there'll be an additional 850 million middle class in China. Um, and then by 2030, 22% of the middle class spend globally will be China, whereas 7% will be the US. So there's this whole kind of economic shift happening right now, and which is very well timed with the Western market as well, because there's a lot of Western fashion brands going out of business, because the, it's, that's a whole other complicated <laughs> situation. But the, the main kind of beat of, of that story is that the whole transition to digital for a lot of Western brands they don't necessarily know how to orchestrate the right strategy to get the right amount of sales and function in this new kind of digital age, so they're losing out on business. Whereas our theory is if we can be the platform to connect those Western brands, which have amazing designs, through to a market which is hungry for them and it's the right timing for them, then we're sitting in a really strategic position. So that was kind of what we based off. So it's mainly timing and then what the market was doing and then I was just decided that come this far, so let's just see if we can find a local partner. And um, then we're connected to Tencent. And how are you connected to Tencent? What's the story of that? Matt Benjamin. Yeah. <laughs> so he had a connection through to some of the guys there, um, as well as um, uh, another lady, Jade, she was quite connected with them as well. And that came after we, um, like after we changed our strategy quite a bit after being on the show. Um, we trended in the Tencent app store, it was one of the best new apps, Quite cool. So we used that as kind of our leg to even get a conversation with them. And the conversation was more so look, we're looking at coming to this market, like we would love some, you know, local knowledge and know-how and all that type thing. So we ended up negotiating a deal in which they uh, it's in two parts. Like the first is they're incubating us for a certain amount of time. So they give us access to resources, know-how, um, assistance with recruitment, office in Shanghai, all those type of resources. And then based on we, you know, hit some internal KPIs, prove out the model, and they have first round of refusal for our next round, which will be in about 12 months. Okay, awesome. And 
So how, um, you know, Tencent really helped you in that sense? Since yeah. you interviewed, what's, what's the experience? It's the, the local know-how because it's obviously such a complex market. So being able to tap into like a resource from Tencent, whether it's marketing or whether it's connections or whether it's like access to what's happening with WeChat Pay at the time and then what they have planned next and then getting first in line to be able to do that. Um, something else they've helped with is if we're, for instance, launching a new feature on Stash, um, they'll position us strategically within their app store, which has 800 million users. So it's a huge mix of just like know-how, access to people, and then just leveraging the resource that they have because Tencent obviously own WeChat, which is WeChat Pay, which is the largest social platform in China as well. So it's, it's leveraging like their assets and then their know-how and then connections to them as well. So you guys doing a lot of WeChat advertising or marketing? We're doing a, yeah, a bit of WeChat advertising. What we're doing is we're relaunching the whole product, um, well, the whole app in November, December this year. So part of that strategy is launching a version of Stash within WeChat um, and then launching a version like of integrating WeChat Pay obviously is the most preferred option and then doing a lot of WeChat advertising and then, and then uh, positioning in the store. So what's the business model now in China? Yeah, it's changed. <laughs> I know it's, you said a lot of changes. A lot has changed. And I don't know what's changed. Yeah, so what the model is now, what we're launching in November, December this year is we also want to be a platform for Western brands to be able to trade and ship and sell it to China. So right now their options are they align with like a Tmall or a me.com and they pay sometimes up to $20,000 as an onboarding fee and they take 10 to 20% commission. For fashion brands in the US, they'll have their brand there, but in the same like, website, you can buy a dress, but you can buy chicken wings, and you can buy a fridge. So it's very, you can buy everything in this one location. Um, whereas we want to be one location for Western brands just aimed at millennials in China. So what the model for us is, we're more so the platform for brands to be able to launch a store on Stashed. When they launch a store on Stash, they pay us a five thousand dollar fee, and what that does is that allows them to upload their products. We then have shipping logistics partners to be able to get their stuff over to China. Um, we have payment partners to be able to tr translate the currencies, um, and then we translate the actual um, the the store as well, so the the language translation as well. So it's more so an avenue for them to be able to tap into the China market without having a China team, without setting up a China business without having to go through all of those hoops. So it's more so via Stashed, they set up a store on Stashed, pay a minimal fee, um, and they have access to a massive market, which we then market the app, which is in turn marketing them via Tencent and via KOLs, and it's all very much so focused on millennials. So it's just decreasing the barrier of looking at China seriously, or just including China as part of their strategy. So these retailers, don't have a local presence in China. No, God no. It's okay. really, really hard. Yeah, a lot of the brands that, if they do have a local presence, they're either a Nike or an Adidas or a Victoria's Secret or Forever 21. So they're a lot more established brands. Um, and to do that is very time consuming, costs a lot of money, a lot of tech, a lot of legal. Like it's a huge it's change in your company structure, a lot of legal costs. So it's a massive investment to do that solo as a brand. Um, and then your options, if you're going to, for instance, look at Tmall or Alibaba, you're one of a, of a lot of different brands that isn't necessarily targeted within your niche, which is fashion, and towards your target market, which is millennials for the brands that we're targeting. So 2017 has been, I've heard, yeah. I'll just look at the news just two days ago. Yeah. The retail is very, where you had a tough day in Western markets. Horrible. Yeah. yeah. So, how about China? What was in China? So time, again, with the timing, like timing is mass a massive thing for us. Um, on the Western side, they've called, I think it was the Huffington Post, like last week, called 2017 the year of the massacre of retail in the US. Like the worst year for retail in the US, right? And then when I was in China last week, um, there was this deal announced with JD.com, which is a shipping logistics company, and a company called Farfetch, which is a luxury e-commerce website. Um, and what the deal was, was JD.com invested $397 million into Farfetch for them to be able to establish more of a local presence into China. And what that did for us was prove out that China's ready for Western brands 
um, and that connection is going to become a lot stronger um, and that's another timing thing for us and it just so happens that again another timing just weird scenario in that the chairman of Farfetch is the previous business partner of our new investor and they were both co-founders of another company called Netaporter which was another billion dollar business so yeah a lot of it's timing in that the US is just horrible and just having a really hard time and China's ready for the disruption realistically and the market's there and they want access to Western and unique brands. Nice. Yeah. And uh, so with your, uh, I've heard in China uh, a lot of shoppings going online, am I right? Because yeah. the, the number of shopping centers being back time in two years ago was very, very limited. So still, most of the people do shop online, or a lot of going to local shop and has a trend of online shop. Yeah. Um, so China like bunny hopped desktop, so they never really shopped on desktop. They went straight to mobile. Yeah. So that was really interesting for us as well, and that they're very used to shopping on mobile. Everything needs to be localized for WeChat Pay, AliPay, JD.com, all that type of thing. Um, they definitely very much so shop on mobile rather than desktop. But I was surprised. Do you have any numbers? What's the percentage? Or? Um, there was, in comparison to the US, the amount of people that are shopping on mobile is 65% in China, and that's in, like the other percent is more so brick and mortar. And then the mobile shopping in the US is 22%, so 22% in the US, 65% in China. So again, it's like tri it's triple in, in the China market. In saying that though, um, and I didn't expect this realistically, but a lot what the brands do in China is they have flagship stores as well. So they're very open to omni-channel too. So the ones that, uh, like Western and Shanghai-based or China-based brands, they'll have like a, a website or they'll be on one of the platforms, but they'll also have brick and mortar stores in Shanghai as their flagship store. And then they'll have stores in like second, third tier cities as well. And they'll be targeting those markets too. And which brands really Chinese you like? They love Adidas, they love Adidas, um, they love, like if you go look at uh, electronics, Apple, because they put their marketing really spot on um, in comparison to say Victoria's Secret, like Victoria's Secret did a campaign, like their last runway show was um, not very long ago, but they part of their runway show was one of the girls was wrapped in a dragon, and that culturally didn't sit too well with China because that's something that's you know very respected, and they had it wrapped around a woman in lingerie. So the backlash from that was they didn't understand the market, they didn't understand what they were doing. Whereas with Nike and Adidas and Apple, their marketing was around very much to millennials. So it was like, you can be individual, you can express yourself, it's a tad rebellious. Um, and it was speaking to them in a language that they understood. Like Nike's campaign was, their slogans obviously just do it. But um, they had a whole video campaign that was like, don't do it how we tell you, do it how you want to do things. And it was just, kind of playing on the whole individual, slightly rebellious take that millennials have as well. So what is, what was your most challenging days in China? Yeah. What really frustrated you or you <laughs> found it really hard and how you overcome it? Yeah, um, initially just the culture shock's pretty intense. Like you get there and you can't speak the language and everything's completely different than what you're used to. So it was just the general kind of culture shock was pretty intense. Like not knowing how to speak the language and then like your Gmail being blocked and your Facebook being blocked and it's just you get there and you're in this place you don't recognise and you can't read anything and you can't really get around so it's just adjusting. <laughs> so I just found little hacks like a little one if I was going to meetings I normally stay in, this, in the same hotel and I would go down to like the guys in the lobby and just tell them my kind of list of locations where I was going to be for the day and they would write out, and I'd make these little like comp cards. So on one side it would be in English where I was going, and on the other side I'd ask them to translate into um, Chinese, and I just use them as like comp cards to give to taxi drivers, and that's how I would get around. <laughs> so it's like little things like that. And then just getting familiar with like the local apps. So there's certain apps that you can type in, um, this one saved my life. Like you can type in a word in English, and it will come up with all these different variances around what it means in Chinese. So that gets you out of a lot of trouble as well. If you're stuck somewhere, and you can just write, okay, where's the exit? You write an exit, it'll come up in Chinese, then you can get out of where you're stuck. Um, so that's helpful, and then it's just like, things like getting a WeChat account, like getting your phone set up, figuring out the bank, like just basic things like that. So it's just like adjusting to life, being completely different to how you know it, really. So it doesn't, 
So don't you think you need a Chinese co-founder? We definitely need an MD, yeah. Okay. So we take a lot of know-how from Tencent at the moment, but we're in the process of recruiting an MD slash co-founder. Um, because realistically, if we're going to develop a robust strategy that's going to build us into, and I have aspirations to build us into a billion dollar business, um, then we need somebody who obviously is ingrained in the market and, and knows all that type thing. So our metrics that we're, we're looking for that is somebody who's ideally kind of an ex Alibaba or team or in mid to top level management, um, ideally has had an exit before, um, can, you know, work well with a Western team. Like there's a lot of different variables that comes into recruiting that type of person as well, but it's definitely necessary and it's something we're not like overlooking obviously because you'd be naive to think that you can just do it yourself because it's such a complex market, but finding the right person is really hard as well. And then just not wanting to kind of skip on that person either, like it's someone you really want to get right. And what has been really worked well for you so yeah. far? I know, I know in a startup, nothing works. Really <laughs> yeah, well. sorry, I don't know. <laughs> but, but what was the best thing, you know, um, so far for you that you know you think really, you know? I mean, ten cent, ten cent was pretty cool. So I mean, that was that was great. So the, aligning with them was really cool, and that helped us open a lot of doors. Just having that alignment was great. Um, and then learning how the KOLs worked in China was big for us too. Um, like their reach, I found, is a lot more organic than um, what we have here with, say, Instagram. Like there's a lot of algorithms that we have here with Instagram and Facebook, which makes the actual reach through to users not as straightforward as, say, Weibo or WeChat or whatever it might be. So learning how to like pull together campaigns with KOLs has been really interesting. Um, and then like nothing's like nothing's like this is a massive win like it's all just you just figure it out as you go and improve incrementally so i couldn't really look back at it and be like we absolutely killed this one thing but um you know you just keep going and you just learn as you go right. and how did you find building a team in China? it's interesting we're still not <laughs> completely there um so, so what's the difference to here to here to here what's the difference yeah well culturally it's very different so, and it's, we want people that can ideally be you know, working with the Western team to a certain degree as well. So at the moment we only have a But in Shanghai, a lot of people speak English, especially young people. Yeah. yeah. So that helps a lot, right? It does, yeah. So, yeah. yeah. What, what, what doesn't help? What doesn't help? Um, well, we're still in the, like right now we don't have an MD business over in China. So once we have that, that will help. Um, and then it's just, you know, like it's just, keeping everybody on the same page team-wise and just general things when you've got an international office and a local office. So I think that's with, that's with multiple different places like have. You would know, like having an office in the US as well. It's just keeping everybody on the same page too. Yeah. Yeah. And time zone is much better. I thought your time zone's fine. Like it's two hours, like that doesn't kill you. <laughs> and uh, any kind of funny story you had in China you want to share? I'm sure that I do. Oh, I mean, two days ago I was stuck in an airport called Chongqing for like a day and a half. I was, it was supposed to be just this very casual like stopover for two hours and I ended up being stuck in an airport Chongqing for like a day and a half. And there's absolutely nothing to do there, so you've just got to kind of sit tight and hope that, <laughs> hope that something happens. But a lot of the time when they do their announcements over the big megaphone as well, they just won't do it in English. So you've just got to kind of follow the crowd and hope for the best a lot of the time. <laughs> so I was there for like a day and a half, just uh, I had my eye on a couple of people when he was on the flight and just was kind of moderately stalking them. So they probably thought I was this crazy person because there wasn't many Westerners on the flight anyway. And I was just kind of just traipsing after these two people who had been the wrong my flight. So that was probably really looked a bit weird. <laughs> we had a lot of fun in next year as well. Yeah. Food, you know, you know, freezing in the cold, you know, it was the hot so cold, wasn't it? And the studio was really, really cold. Yeah. So they had this massive studio and no heating or anything, so it was it was freezing cold. It was in the middle of winter too. Yeah, yeah. 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 What what was your like weirdest experience from China, like in the next year one? Um You didn't like the food very much, I remember that. No, I remember it was terrible. <laughs> uh, so the US I think the worst ever food back then and um, yeah it was very very freezing but I was lucky I had uh, one of my colleagues there so he helped a lot yeah. Chinese um, oh that's right the, she was wearing it wasn't she yeah. what was her name again? Yeah. Fiona that's right yeah. yeah 
and all sun on the thing was um, we just you know the challenge of changing the plan because there was a first ever show that they'd done it in China in China and Shanghai and they were they didn't have that much experience so with they changing plan here and there and one day we're saying okay you're doing this stuff and the next day we're changing it suddenly and we have to prepare the whole thing and working yeah. day and night yeah. working the presentation there wasn't and the next, day, the, the next day the next day we're saying oh no, you have to present this way yeah. so, no we we're preparing for something else <laughs> <laughs> but they would change like major components that were like we thought we were pitching for two minutes so they have no five minutes yeah. you're like oh, we're going to come up with like a whole double of the size of this speech and they'll change like what you're supposed to be focusing on as well like it was very like yeah. i found it another interesting thing was i found that was the first experience i had teams from different part of the world yeah. so i was israeli teams as well and yeah. how they were interacting and yeah. how you know yeah, Asian team were interacting, so we're different cultures, different, you know, personality as well, mm -hmm. and that was a very, very unique experience. That was very cool. Like, who were the Israeli teams on the out of it? There was... Yeah, I can't remember the company's name, but it was Shai, yeah. the Oh, the US, yeah. 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 So, yeah. No, there was a lot, it was very, it was a very it was international. Three, I think it was three Israelis. Three Israeli teams, yeah. Yeah. And a lot of what the judges were looking for was like, Firstly, can it become, like, have the ability to scale this model into a billion dollar business? Or if this is model, how you have it right now, are you open to changing it? And is there a market for who, like, what your business is in China as well? So there was all these different things that the judges were looking for too. Yeah. That was interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Good time. Good memory. Yeah. It was, yeah, it was funny. I'm probably speaking really fast. I've had like two coffees. <laughs> What's the next 12 months look like for Smash? The next 12 months, we're relaunching the app in November, December. So, a lot of the next few months is securing Western brands here and then relaunching into China. So, we're doing initiatives. So, we're strengthening the relationships with the shipping logistics companies, payments companies, and translation companies. So it's that whole process of Western fashion into China, articulating that through campaigns. Um, and then one of the major campaigns we're doing is the ability for KOLs to launch a store on Stashed. Um, what they do is select products from the product range that we have. All the brands are exclusive on Stashed as well, so they can't buy them on any other platforms in China. Um, and then we give them a 30% commission, which is double what any of the other people that they'd be aligning with be giving them. Um, and then growing that out and then incrementally being introducing a manufacturing arm of the business as well. So once the KOLs have launched a store on Stash, they've got these products which align with their personal brand, they're making 30% up all the sales. We then have partnered with a manufacturing company so they can have a certain say in what their unique style is. That manufacturing company goes and develops um, a capsule collection, so maybe a 10-piece collection that's in that KOL's name and then is sold exclusively through their store. So it's almost where creating little hubs of fast fashion within Stash headed up by KOLs. So the first step's Western fashion into China to be able to get us all the brands, and the second step is to align them with KOLs and then give them the manufacturing ability as well. Can you elaborate a bit on KOLs? I don't think I've heard of them. Yeah, so KOLs are key opinion leaders. So they're essentially the equivalent of like Instagram influencers in China. Um, the platforms they use is like maybe Weibo, WeChat, WeChat Moments. And um, there's certain ways you can engage them. Like normally it's, they'll do something as simple as like, take a, like an image with your product and post that to their audience. The best ones that get the most um, traction are the, the posts that are more authentic, obviously. So it's not overly forced, but it's um, like, it, like if, for instance, if it's like a fitness blogger in there, it would make sense for them to be posting around like a, a yoga mat or something. Like it's got a fitting with their personal brand as a KOL as well. Um, so there's a few different ways you can engage them. You can either flat out, like flat out pay them, you can give them commissions on everything they sell, you can do both of them, you can do exclusive discounts for that KOL, or if you want to get a, like a huge amount of engagement, you can do certain initiatives where like they react really well to travel experiences. So whether it's you organise for two KOLs to go to a certain location and live stream through Huawei or MePi or whatever it is, the whole process, then that could get you a lot more content 
by getting maybe flat sponsored a uh, hotel sponsored to a certain location and then just get them to so like, how, how important do you think they are? For our audience, very important because our consumers being millennials, the way they make buying decisions is based off other people who are somewhat higher than, than them when it comes to their opinions, so kind of experts. I don't know if that would work for every business, but it definitely works for our one being because our markets are millennials and that's how they make decisions really. Yeah, or one of the ways to make decisions, yeah. So did you talk about um, launching all the Western brands and given that your audience is millennials, yeah. do you have certain ideas of how you're going to position those brands? Are they going to be like far-fetched, like really luxury market, yeah. or is it going to be like really fast fashion? Influences, yeah. How do you say K-O-L? K-O-L, yeah. K-O-L. K-O-L. Key opinion is, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, no, so we won't be going for the luxury fashion tier. We're more than happy to far, for Farfetch to own that space. It's more so the like designer brands, um, which you probably more so in like terms of like position as mid-tier brands, so not necessarily fast fashion, but here to be more so like your Camilla, Camilla Ramar, um, those type brands. So if you went down like maybe Oxford Street and, and places like that, a lot of those brands that would make sense for Stash. So not necessarily luxury being Louis Vuitton or Gucci or Chanel or anything, but more so the, the mid-tier brands. Because they've got a budget to be able to do it and fill orders, and they've got a certain uniqueness around them as well. What, what was the big change though in the business model from the last one to the new one? Yeah. Um, the previous one was we just had a position so we would take a percentage of everything that we sold. Um, the main change was we're facilitating a lot of um, the process for brands. So we plug them in to have shipping logistics partners, payment partners, we translate the store, and we positioned ourselves to more so be the platform so we don't hold the stock. We don't have to handle any of the uploading or deloading of products. Like it's all set up so brands can create and design their own store, which then automatically plugs into all the resource that we have. Um, and then we've also given them the ability to market test products. They can select up to 20 products that they want to be market testing. Um, they can then view those analytics um, in a backend that we call Stashboard. Stash Dashboard, we thought we were a bit creative. Um, and <laughs> Well, the whole point of that was is China's obviously a very complex market. Their market could be in a second, third tier city, maybe not Shanghai. So if we can give them an insight into who their consumers are, what their opinions are, then maybe they need to be zoning on a different kind of section of China that they might not have expected. So it's the whole changing more so to a platform. There's a straight onboarding fee because we've given them the resources of all the shipping logistics payments and conversions and then the added in section of um, the data insight too so they can make more informed decisions of if they're going to go into China seriously, where are they going to be you know, investing into marketing if they choose to do that. You have that feature, you know, like Tinder. Yes, yeah, so that's just been that's been tightened up a lot more okay. <laughs> since, since what it was. Can I explain it? And yeah, so a lot where Stash started was it was kind of like Tinder for fashion, right? So it was like. So what year was that when you started? Uh, 2014. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So the way it started was kind of Tinder for fashion. So you'd be pre presented with one item that you'd either swipe left to trash to never see again, or you'd swipe right to stash, and once you've stashed something, it gets moved into your virtual wardrobe. And that's essentially a centralized wish list. So everything you move into that wardrobe, you can then go through and purchase. Um, but the whole process of the swipe right and swipe left, that was essentially gamified market research. So each time somebody swipes right or left, we capture their opinion on the product, and we've got details around who the users are, where they're located, a profile data on them, um, as well as data on the product. So what the color is, the cut is, the price is, the brand is, um, and the whole concept around that is um, if we can look at what consumers like in real time, then we can start to trend forecast a lot more accurately than what the capabilities are right now because we're getting a different level of insight, which is somebody's opinion, which hasn't necessarily been digitalized yet. Like the only other ways you can do that is by sending out mass emails or doing focus groups or just literally going and asking people. So that's where it's done and it's still in parts of Stashed, yeah. Nice. Oh. So how is it different then? 
Um, so Stash was quite simple in that you'd have a store and it would just be the swipe functionality. Now it's when stores want to store on Stash, that's a section within the store is the ability to swipe right or swipe left. So it's just been tightened up a little bit more. And they've only got the ability to market test a capped amount of products because we found that by capping it at say 20 to 25 products, then they get more data around the key products that they want information back on anyway. So they, they would work it as a campaign. This round is a woman named Megan Quinn. Um, she was the co founder of a company called Netaporter. Um, she'd previously grown that business into a billion dollar business, and she understands retail more than anybody I've ever met in my life. So, by speaking to her around how the market's changing, she knew how it's changing in the US. Once you speak to her, her around consumer trends in China, um, I'd known her previously as a mentor for a good three years previously. Um, that she was willing to put a bet on um, the business model, the market, the retail, how it was changing in the US. So once we had her as a lead investor, we then found follow-on investors to follow on with her. We do have Chinese investors now, I just can't say them yet. But that was our strategy, was bringing on somebody who was an expert in retail um, and very well known, and then finding up follow-on investors to then, to then follow with her. company structure. We've set up a VIE, so first we went and set up a, a Wofi account, so to be able to launch an app essentially into the app stores you need to have a Wofi account, so that was the first step for us, and now we've progressed into a VIE so that we can take in money from Australia, we can take in money from China, it's just a different company structure now. I'm saying that we have a Chinese subsidiary, which is what um, certain shareholders have equity in, but the like the investment vehicle we're taking money into is a VIE structure. Or the IP itself, yeah. And then we filter that through to the China subsidiary. The parent company is in Australia, but that'll be moving as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. As part of the VIE, it's the most complicated <laughs> restructure, but yeah. like we, we knew that going into the market. So in, it's more so from the consumer perspective, if they're looking for those unique Western brands, the way we're positioning ourselves is more so the trusted place to go to for those Western brands. So we lock all those brands on exclusively. So we more so definitely the platform, but the value of Stashed is the brands that we're aligned with and all those brands are aligned on exclusively with Stashed um, and then all the IPs held in the parent company. So it's not held in the company in which Tencent has a shareholding in, um, so it's structurally all held in the parent company, and then our, I guess, asset is the brands that we have on board, and then we lock them all on exclusively. Yeah. Any more questions, guys? Yeah. I think we can wrap this up. Um, cool. I just, just want to give a quick thank you again uh -huh. to Jess and Bunny for joining us. Thank you for our sponsor, Alibaba Cloud, and to David for coming in and supporting us today.